Well, it's going to be a great day. I have a working hat on, a good comfy shirt, good cottony shirt to get this done with. This is not going to be a typical video, but I think it'll be worth watching. Let's get started. Well, hello everyone. Let's say we've got ourselves into a situation where we're deciding that we just have to remodel our kitchen. We're tired of looking at it. Well, there's some situations that you can run into that are often overlooked. I'm going to deal with just one of those, and I'm not really going to be a typical how you install a sink type of video because there are tons of those out there, including the big box stores, the, the uh, plumbing stores, supply houses that sell these things. They make it where it looks just so easy. But there is something that you can easily run into, especially if you want a deep sink, what you might find after the fact, after you're already committed, your heart's already set on a particular style and type of sink, and you've gotten in there, and maybe you've even gone so far as to cut out the, the cabinet if it is one of those that then requires it, like a skirted sink, or what do they want to call them? A lot of them call them farmhouses, but unless you're actually out on acreage, it's not in a farmhouse. It may be a farmhouse style, but it's not a farmhouse. And I will say that a front skirted sink has one advantage others don't have. If you have it where it projects out over the edge of the cabinet, I mean, pushes out significantly, the, any drippage that comes through may collect on the bottom of that skirt and drip to the floor versus running down your cabinet making a mess. So that's always nice. That's the one thing I do like about them. Other than that, I'm not a big fan of the skirted sink, the farmhouse sinks, because you are then committed to that for the life of that cabinetry. And I don't know if you've priced any cabinets and cabinets install lately, but they're not cheap. So maybe by that time you end up expanding your scope of your remodel to another $30,000 for the cabinets and install, you know, install or whatever. And that's not going to be a lot of fun for a lot of folks. So you can modify, modify a lot of these cabinets. If you get a shallow enough sink, you can just take out the little blank that's in front where the sink is, just pop that out or unscrew it if it's screwed in. But then you're just stuck with that style of sink from here on out. Now, if you choose to not modify the cabinet, you have a better choice of having an underslung or undermount. You can have a flush mount with some if you do it right, although your countertop guy will probably fuss at you a little bit because it makes his job a little bit harder to keep uh, the gap around the, the sink that's then flush mounted with the thickness of the, the slab that they're using and we have to coordinate those, but I do like those fairly well. And the, the top mounted, which are probably the easiest for the, the homeowner to do themselves because you can remodel a kitchen change the color of the cabinets if you're tired of looking at woods especially if it's sort of that dated kind of orange oak that was real popular that just was what was being manufactured years ago you can change that out paint the cabinets redo a sink put a sink in there put a new top mount down on top of a new granite or solid surface whatever type of of um, surface you want for your countertop you might even go butcher block and these things have different thicknesses so you t you get the advantage if you go top mount to gaining another inch or so and maybe less than an inch depending on the thickness of the countertop but you can gain a little bit of height uh, or depth rather into the well of the sink by having that sink on top of the the surface you're going to mount it versus under i like them under personally have since i saw my first one in a commercial establishment because you can squeegee all your water when you're cleaning down it gets right into the sink and i like that that little neatness factor to it although there's nothing wrong with a surface mount the type i'm not a big keen advocate of are the ones with a real tall lip because you still end up having that that the edge around there that wants to have some buildup over time i'm not a big fan of the square folded sinks although they usually are available in a little heavier gauge because they're going to fold them up and welding is easier even robotic welding is easier with thicker materials but then you still have that 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 little tight square joint in there in this corners of your sink to keep clean i prefer a pressed uh, type metal sink you can go cast iron 
Downside of cast iron that's been enameled is enamel will chip if you drop something heavy in it and sometimes it happens. Sometimes they go a lifetime, never take a chip. Grandma's got one that's about 50 years old and her enameled sink is not in bad shape. So it won't necessarily happen to you, but it can happen to you. And also cast iron sinks are extremely heavy. They said a kitchen sink is gonna get used and abused. That's one reason why I don't particularly like the black stainless because that scratch is pretty easy. Now, if you look at, if you're looking at a stainless, that's what I'm going to use in this. It's, it's my favorite material to make a kitchen sink out of. I don't care what the trends are. It's just more practical. And you can get, you can get a decent sink for $400 to $500. If you really want to go high dollar, you can go $2,000 with one with some of the fancy uh, custom made water systems and things like that. A lot of times you're about $400, three to $400 will be your base for a kind of new modern style sink, and that's up to you what you want to do. They just charge maybe $100 extra for a cutting board that slides across or something like that, or some extra drains or some gadgetry to go with it. Again, that's up to you. So this video is not really geared at that. It's geared at avoiding a costly oversight that is probably more likely to happen to a homeowner trying to do a DIY remodel themselves than say somebody who's already run into this at some point in time. So this is what this video is about. So let's get into the thing I'm trying to get you to see before you commit and chop out your cabinets. Let's get to it. Now I realize I've trimmed from the shot the best part of the video, which is going to be my pretty face. But as I take my little professional pointer, one of the things that you're going to find they'll all have is they all got to have their water valve. These are your potable water. I happen to have an extra one because I have a, a whole house reverse osmosis system put in. Now this is going to be your issue. Where is this located in your house? Because if you want to do a shallow sink, this depth is not going to be that big a deal. The shallow sink also helps you with the total weight you're going to be, ever be able to put in that sink because it's going to go away, right? You can only fill it up so far without having the spillage. But if you want a deep well, you have to have an idea of where that is, and that's where we go next. Now, as you can see from this video, this shot does far out shot, you see this is a fairly deep, fairly deep tub, and it is 10 inches deep. And that can be a problem if you're doing a, a retrofit or a remodel and your plumbing is already in there. If your stub out, the part that comes out of the wall for your drain, if it is for, say it's a, an older home that's already been in place for a long time and we had maybe a six inch deep sink six eight that stub out may actually be a little too high and cause you problems so your your grand plan of putting in maybe a deep tub may not work without having a real serious complication and that being that you have to rip your cabinets out cut into the wall and modify that drain now that's certainly doable if you have enough money to throw at the situation but it's going to be time and you need to have planned on that if that's really what you want. A common way people deal with that is simply to put a short or a shallow, if you will, farmhouse type skirted sink in an existing cabinet where they can just cut out that upper blank anyway. They can remove the blank and cut out that part of the cabinet. But again, if you have a half lap doors, you may be in a little bit better shape than if you have uh, full lap doors as we might have so you need to you need to check those dimensions carefully before you commit to buying a sink because no one really expects you if you're a DIYer to be an expert and there's no reason for you to pretend to be so but at the same time it can be a bit inconvenient to, have, to order something especially if it's special order some places will charge you 20 percent restocking on that then turn around and discount that and sell it off and still make a little bit of money off of that that sink that you couldn't use but somebody else could so if you're paying the bill be aware that you may have to do some plumbing on the drain and that may require 
some upgrades. For instance, back in the day, we used to have a little loop that we would put in the kitchen, especially under windows. Now you can't do that loop because of the threat of back siphonage, although it normally wasn't a big deal, but it could happen in some cases. So now you have to put an air admittance valve in there and you can buy air admittance valves, but the problem with them are they typically are in the back of your cabinet. I have one downstairs, it's an island. We have to put them in islands, but you do have to replace them from time to time because the mechanism can wait long enough and they can start to not seal very well. And you can sometimes get a little bit of the, the sewer smell come back into your kitchen and something smells rotten, you don't want that. But that is an issue that you might have to get into if you have to relocate that drain. That will certainly, in most cases, to my knowledge, require you pull a, a plumbing permit for it. Whereas maybe this little bit of remodeling only gives you a remodel permit. You don't have to do a full plumbing to go with it. Plumbing and electricals, they typically are separate or add-on, at least in my area, they're add-on charges. But this is the tub. It's actually a very nice tub. It's, it's a fully radius kind of a uh, nice rounded corner. It's a drawn sink, one piece. I like that about it. It's 16 gauge. That's heavier than 18, obviously. A little bit less likely to ding. And we have some sound deadening and it looks like maybe even a little reinforcement on the bottom to support that. It's got a draft that goes actually up toward the drain because we got it upside down and it works pretty good. But now I have a dishwasher right next to it. And that requires me to have a tailpiece with a dishwasher port right here. Now I just want to take a quick moment to point this out. You may not have the International Residential Code adopted in your jurisdiction, but according to this code that goes back several different editions of generations, however you might want to call it, you have two places to discharge your dishwasher into a tailpiece in a sink so it goes down into a p-trap of at least an inch and a half in diameter or you can go into your garbage disposal now my opinion for going into the garbage disposal the point of that is to take that wastewater that hot wastewater from the dishwasher and clean that nasty beast to help keep some of the odors and stinks down that garbage disposals are famous for plus if you add a garbage disposal realize that it's going to be neck down from the sink some distance and depending on the model you might find that to be nine and a half ten inches or all the way down to 15 inches which puts your drain stub out extremely low in your cabinet so it's another reason why when i talk about i don't particularly like garbage disposals i don't particularly like garbage disposals for multiple reasons now, if you have something, if you're doing a remodel in a home that has a garbage disposal, first of all, I'm not dinging on garbage disposals, but I don't really like garbage disposals from, this, from the position of going in the kitchen for two reasons. One, if it's a septic system, you're just asking for trouble. You're just feeding that septic system with more solids that will take a while to break down. Okay, it's not like something has already been broken down in a biological machine and then flushed. It's something that goes in your drain and you normally only have like a two inch, two inch drain line, something along that line in your house to start with. And it's really not made for solid waste per se. It's made for draining waters, fluids, something like that. So it can be a little bit of an issue. Now, if you have what we call a waste separator, which is a basket that goes under your sink, which is the equivalent of the Al Gore dishwashers, like the Bosch's that now don't have the garbage disposal in them. They'll have a screen and a catch that gunks up with food that doesn't dissolve and pass through the screen. And you have to change that screen out to keep your, keep your sink and kitchen under sink from stinking of rotting material. So I'm just not a big fan for garbage disposal. But also this, this garbage disposal will have to have the port in it. And normally that's where we put the uh, dishwasher discharge, the effluent from the discharge goes into the, the uh, mechanism, but that mechanism is sink mounted and it has to have a drain and it's, it's got a little bit of a space for it. So you have to plan for it. This particular sink was about $300. 
which is a pretty good price for what I got here. But now I found out why is this one not $500? Well, it doesn't have the slidey bars and stuff like that. And I like it has a little bit of a style. It has a little cut in here for my faucets because I'm going to put a, a little soap dispenser in on mine. And I have to be able to reach it. And I don't know if you can tell, but that's going to be awfully hard <laughs> to get to. But yet, I would rather put it in. I'd rather have it and not need it and need it and not have it because I don't really want to have my bars or soap or whatever on the counter. I'd really rather have a dispenser. So I'm going to keep that. So that's where a deep tub can be a little bit of an issue. If you're going to have a soap dispenser, you might want to think about taking it a little bit more shallow. Now, what I was talking about on this being, it's not as pricey as it normally I would expect it to be. It is a heavier gauge of stainless. It is sound dampened. It's a really nice drawn sink, which means it's pressed. It's not folded up and then welded with those tight corners that I don't like. I don't like a tight corner in a sink. This piece came with it. This is what came with the sink. Now you might call that the neck or whatever, this, what would you call this? Well, most of us call this the strainer because we think that's what it is. But in plumbing terms, this is the strainer. This is a tailpiece. But as you can see from this example, my tailpiece is now sitting about six inches off the bottom of the tub. Okay? And it's a 10 inch tub. So that means I have to be at least 16 inches down for that drain. Maybe yours is not that far down from the top of the counter. Now you can gain an inch or so if you have a top mounted sink because you're going on top of the thickness of the, count of the countertop. And you may have a butcher block, maybe an inch. You may have uh, a rock top and it may be less than that, maybe three quarters. It may be an inch, maybe a little bit more. Or you might have something else, a, a solid surface even thinner than that. That may be just fine or laminate. That, that may good, be good too, but you're not gonna gain that much height. So if the sink is mounted on top, it's going to go up a little bit, making this bottom a little bit taller. Do you have the room under your sink to do that? You want to measure. Now, this is a little bit of a problem, and I would say that this is an issue for some people if they were to buy the sink that's going to have to buy something else, and I'll show you that in just a second. Hey, appreciate you watching. Do me a favor, if you will, subscribe to the channel, either the YouTube or the Rumble channel, which this appears in. And if you can, check the notification bell or settings to make sure that you get notified when new videos are posted. Appreciate it. Now here we have our issue. As I pointed out, this can be an issue. When I was looking at the kitchen, I did want a deep tub. And I figured probably seven, eight inches would work. And I had my initial rough in on the stub out for that height. And then later I decided, well, I really kind of like something a little bit bigger. I don't have to fill it all up with water. I just need something to maybe to keep my splashing down in the kitchen. And I found a pretty good deal on this particular sink. And I liked it. I like the style of it. It's rounded and smooth. I'm an old man. I like things with curves. Sharp edges are, are not my thing. So I kind of like that nice round curve, especially when your cabinetry is pretty, pretty sharp edged itself but this is an issue and that makes an even greater challenge because where's my pointer here's my pointer now that puts this right here this connection just a little shy of four inches so now i'm at least 14 inches before i can even get to this surface and because i have a dishwasher we talked about this thing being a tailpiece if i have it here that puts that tailpiece down another two inches or so and I can't adjust this portion. This portion if I have a, an inlet on the tailpiece for the dishwasher I can't adjust it so I'm automatically stuck with two more inches and the next slip fitting can, has to have some room to have that piece loose the top part of the furl to, to, uh, to connect to the slip connection and that puts my height way down here toward the bottom of the sink. Now it will drain, the sink will drain as long as the entry to the wall is lower than this point. The problem is we have to get a trap and we have to get the other stuff in there. So what are my options to, 
to minimize that because this can be an issue if you're a little short of space and you still want to have the deepest you can have but still have it fit into your into your cabinet well the first thing I'd probably go top mount or underslung in your kit sink base so that you have one you, if you go top mount you'll gain another thick a little bit of thickness there called we'll call it an inch so you'll gain the inch there plus you'll have the ability to be a little deeper than say the skirted sink or farmhouse type sink, right? Because you're, you can go deeper than that edge on the front where you're just cutting out the blank. But I can also do this. This, this is the strainer, this thing. We'll get some close-ups of these things. This is the strainer. The other thing is called the basket that we showed earlier. Now, if I use this type of strainer, I can put it here. I'm now only about two inches from there. So I've gained two more inches. Now I've got it set into place and I'm using two jacks. You can see the feet of them right here. And I would normally have taken off the foam flange protectors, but I don't need it for this case. I've already set the jacks. To get an idea of the clearance I have below. You would just use a level or straight edge to get, because this is um, an underslung or undermount. It's just going to be level with where the tape, the countertop goes on top. It'll come up underneath, and so that sets my distance below. But you'll notice this is a left offset sink, and so it has obviously offset here, and it's also offset in the back. And that purpose of that choice is to allow down here the most depth that I can get underneath the sink because this is a deep well. Or deep tub however you want to call it it would bring the the trap out this way and the piping and whatnot behind it would come forward and that would eat into the available usable space below and of course we're set up here our main faucet I've got a Moen Indy come here it's a pre-rinse this is good for pre-rinse we have the dishwasher just there to the side over here on this corner will be the reverse osmosis faucet. The soap will be in the middle. And of course, right there you have the coffee pot plug in. All right, well, we're nearly at the end of this video. You need to stay tuned for a little bit of a coach quiz. And we've got our sink set up. We've got the wrapper off of it, a straight edge across the top. The tape measure here so let's go see where I stub this out 17 inches now let's look at the drain the tailpiece we got two inches we could easily take away here and drop this down so this happens to be a 10 inch sink probably around seven maybe eight is about standard so we're two inches deeper we could go as deep as 12 inches and 12 inches with 5 is 17. Where did we stub this out? 17 inches. So someone planned ahead on that. So you might ask, well, why in the world do we make such a big deal out of that thing? Well, because you might get into a bind at some point in time on a remodel and not be able to make the connection. So... Yes, you can get a sink as, as skinny as five and a half inches, five and a half or so for something. I don't know what you'd use that for, a bar or a trailer type of thing, uh, RV type trailer. Don't know, but we can make it work. Now, we're going to have a discussion about this. Do we use a long sweep or can we use a tight 90? A pressure 90. We'll talk about that in just a second. Well, welcome to your quiz on code. For a kitchen sink, which one of these two L's can you use on your drain? Well, according to the IRC, ICC's public access, which is free, you can use either one of these on a drain that's two inches or less. So either one is appropriate. Now a long L sweep is easier to, to run a snake through if you ever need to than a tight one. But the tight one has a little bit more surface area, a little stronger. But again, it's a sink drain. How much do you need there? Now this happens to be a sweep 
90 for the under sink. What I'm going to use, I'm going to use that because it's going to be solvented on the pipe and I don't want to, if I ever have to go through that stub out, that long 90 might be a little more useful. But I want to point something out to you. This is a Danco inch and a half. It's a slip fitting. I want you to notice how tight that 90 is. So, according to the public access website of the ICC for the IRC, unless it's otherwise prohibited, you can use a tight 90, tight 45. Let's take a moment to add to the content. I know it's long, but you've stood by it this far. Let's get something else out of it. Let's talk about valves real quick. I've used two types of valves here for demonstration purposes. This one is a slip type. Some people might call them shark bite. Shark bite's a brand, guest fitting, tubing fittings. A lot of them have like that. That works good. You can take that off and replace it because there's no permanent connection. There's no solventing of the connection on there and you can replace that valve easily. The downside to it is you can't twist the body of the valve when it's got pressure on it. Now, these other three are ProFlow brand, all right? And they're made so that you can actually take the fitting off. If you have the solvent end fitted onto it, here's the furl of one. If you have this, this spins on the insert that's on the pipe. So if we were to have a bad valve, a valve that locks up, we can't get it apart, we can take it loose at the ferrule, take the valve off, put another valve on. And so you can do that because you don't have to uh, glue the fitting back on for cold water in 7 degrees or above. You have to wait an hour to put pressure on it. On hot water, you have to wait 6. If you use a ProFlow valve like this, you can change it and not have to wait. Mm -hmm.